Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. And so now he moves into chapter 7, <clears throat> which I like to call the schizophrenic chapter, because you know, that I would do, I don't do, that which I don't do, I would do, and that kind of, he goes on. It's not really as complicated as it ends up sounding. We, we've tried to re, uh, say stuff here. I think you have to have the right perspective of the baseline of where he's coming from. So let's get in here. No, uh, um, verse 23 of the previous chapter says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, the wages of obeying the dominion of sin, the sin nature, is death. It produces death in everything it touches. Okay? Yielding your members as servants of unrighteousness does not produce life. It produces death. Amen? Now, Paul goes in chapter 7, verse 1, says this, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. Now here, first of all, he's saying that you have to have a perspective of the law to understand what I'm about to say. You can't drop that out and just start saying this stuff, not having a view or an understanding of the law. All right? And Paul, you know, and so let's go on. How that the law hath dominion over man as long as he liveth. For the, and then he says, For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband is dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, but she is married to another. Now stop. He's talking. He's using an allegory. He's going, to, he's going to compare being married in the natural, divorced and remarried to, you know, if that man's still alive, you're still bound. And that's why we have to say he that is, uh, he that is dead to sin, amen, you're, you're no longer under that obedience in the previous chapter. If you're dead to sin, you no longer have to obey sin. And you see here, if the woman's husband's still alive, she's bound by him. And so we've been married to sin. We've been married in the allegory. And the, now, don't, don't go, the pastor said we're married to the, no, it's an allegory. It's, it's a type. It's a shadow. It's a, it's, it's a picture. And if you were married to sin, then you have to be dead to sin in order to be free to be married to another. Sin has to be dead to you so that you can be free to be married to another. Amen. All right. Wherefore, my brethren, you also become dead to the law by the body of Christ, <clears throat> being born again. Amen. What happens? We were, de we're, we're dead to the, old, to the old nature. We're alive to the new nature. We're talking about your spirit now. That you should be married to another, even to him that's raised, that is raised from the dead, that we, whom that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the, now listen. When you were un, when, unborn again, before the new birth, you were subject to the passions of the flesh. The Bible tells us that. We yielded ourselves. We were subject. We were constrained by the dictates of the flesh. It's amazing that once man fell and lost his estate with God, the flesh became the dominant part of his nature. But see, when you get born again, your spirits become the dominant part of your nature. Amen. Hallelujah. Notice that the three sins, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. All we're dealing with, with uh, uh, how you thought and what how, and in your body. Lust of the flesh, the, the, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Didn't say anything about the lust of the spirit. All right? See, when man fell, he fell in the arena, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. All right? Remember when Jesus was... Uh, tempted by Satan in the, in, in the, um, after the 40 days of fasting, tempted him with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Lust of the flesh, turn these stones into bread. Lust of the eyes, here's all the kingdoms of the earth. I'll give them to you if you'll bow down and worship me. The pride of life, you know, cast yourself down from here because it's written that the angels shall bear thee up. All right? And so man became a carnal, flesh-dominated, and flesh-ruled being. Whatever the appetites of the flesh were, that's what he obeyed. All right. For when we were in the flesh, or dominated by the flesh, the motions of sin that were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, be, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve a newness of spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter. 
And Paul's making a, he's going, he's going to argue, making an argument here. Understand that <clears throat> the Old Testament law. Now, some people get mixed up. They think, and, and Paul deal, deals with this in this chapter. They think that that the law should be completely done with, and if anything we say has to do with the law, in, in light of what the law says, then we don't obey it. And that's not true. The law, <clears throat> which was given 400 years after the promise, was given to, to constrain the flesh in obedience to God. Paul even goes on and says, the law was given to show me that sin was sin. All right? But it doesn't mean the law was bad. These are still the things that God demands from a holy person. It's just that they're not done by simply constraining the flesh. And this is where we get into the battle between the crazy grace and righteousness, being born again and living out of your spirit and doing good works that, that are fruits of righteousness or fruits of our salvation. And whereas the old covenant was, was trying to bring you to salvation through the works of the, of, the, of, the, of the law, which it couldn't do. No one could obey it. Why? Because they were, they were, as a matter of fact, Paul goes on and says this. <coughs> what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. No. Had I not, I, not, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I, I, I had not known lust, except the law said, thou shalt not covet. All right? But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. I said it right. Hallelujah. For the first time on the first pass. Hallelujah. There's a miracle in the house today. Concupiscence. Hallelujah. For while the law of sin was dead. All right. <clears throat> in other words, there was nothing to say. You know, it's kind of like going in there and, you know, you, you're doing wrong. And somebody says, you can't do that. That's wrong. Well, nobody ever told me. Well, now I'm telling you it's wrong. Now there's something to measure it against. Now, probably on the inside of you, you knew it was wrong, but you didn't have any legal right, anything in writing that told you it was. So I can get away with it because, you know, that's how, that's how humans think. You know it's wrong, but nobody told you it's wrong, so you're going to do it. Now, what's, what's this thing in America they say in the court system? Ignorance of the law is no excuse. Now, I think that should apply to all the Miranda junk. Anyway. That's the stupidest thing in the world. If you're a citizen, you should know your rights. You shouldn't have to have a policeman tell you that while they're arresting you. Well, anyway, I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to get myself in trouble. For I was alive without the law once, but, now listen, for without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. In other words, it made, it, it showed forth and declared that sin was sin. And at that point, the nature of sin slew him as it were. And the commandment that was ordained to life, I found to be in the death. Why? Because it was, a car, it was, it was carnal ordinances or, or ordinances written to the carnal man who could not do them. You won't covet. If without a change of the nature of man, you're going to covet. You won't commit, don't commit adultery. Without a change in the nature of man, you're going to commit adultery. People gonna, people to, we got people in church doing it now. Because they found out that they, they found out from some bozo that it was okay, <coughs> according to the law of the bozo. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, just because some bozo says it, don't make it so. It makes it a bozo law. And last time I saw bozo the clown, he had kind of white bald head with red hair sticking out the sides. I don't listen to anything he says. Anyway. Wherefore, verse 12, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good unto me made death unto me, God forbid, but sin that it might appear sin. Working death in me by that which is good and that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. The law was given to show what, was, what God demanded, what God demanded in order to live in his presence. All the law, you had to do it all to be able to come on your merits to stand before him. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean just because we're not under the law that homosexuality is okay. God said it was profane before him. Doesn't mean that getting drunk and, 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 being, and, and whoring around was okay. 
those things were uh, profane to him. The things that the law declared to be sinful and sin are still sinful and sin. You weren't able not to do them. We're told not to do them because that's what they were. Because you came under grace and became the righteousness of God in Christ did not abdicate you from the fact that they're still sinful. No, the righteousness that you've received and the grace, the strengthening grace of God you've received and living in that newness of life on that whole new plane that you've received empowers you, to, as we said last week, to say no to those things, whereas before you couldn't. Why? Because you were under the domination of the, of the law. The law said it was sinful, and you were under sin nature, and sin nature said you're going to do them anyway, and because you did them and the law said you couldn't do them, sin revived, you died. There was no way around it. You couldn't not do it. You were incapable of doing it all. Amen. Jesus even came along in the new covenant. You know, and the Bible said in the old covenant, you know, if you commit adultery, that, that, that. Jesus said, if you look on another woman to lust after, you've committed adultery already in your heart. He took it up. He didn't lower the, the, the baseline. He raised it. He took it up, not just a notch. He took it way up. He went from doing it is sinful to thinking about doing it sinful. He raised the bar. How other, well, come on. He didn't lower it. He raised it. That goes over real good. Think about that now. He didn't come along and say, hey, because I've come, you're going to be made righteous through me. It doesn't matter what you do. No, he came along and said, hey, look, if you even think about it, you've already done it in your heart. Everybody say, ouch. Was then that which is good to me, death unto me, God forbid, but sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. We, God had to make sure everyone understood what sin was so that he could send Jesus to redeem us. Amen? And we would recognize that this is wrong. God doesn't, God doesn't allow this in his presence. God doesn't allow this in his heart. You know, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. They didn't say without being under grace, they said without holiness. What's that mean? You've got to live a lifestyle. You, we've got to. People get all hung up on words. Your lifestyle should be a manifest representation of the inner work that God's done. Holiness should be coming out of you. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, so to understand. Now listen, let me say something here. Paul is not talking about his present state. He's talking about, because remember, go back up here, is the law sin? Uh, and he says, God forbid. He's talking about that, that coming into the things of God and being, and, and being controlled by his flesh without the revelation of who we are in Christ and how to overcome those things. He's not talking about his, Paul was not in the present state of, you know, being carnal. He understood. He, he goes on in the next chapter. But here in this one, he's explaining something. He says, um, for I know the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal, sold under sin. He, he, well, you were sold under the dominion of sin. But when you get born again, you're not. But I tell you what, E.W. Kenyon makes a, a very, very bold statement in his writings. The Christian who does not renew their mind to the word of God will imitate a sinner. The Christian who does not renew their mind to the word of God will imitate a sinner. Meaning what? Because you don't know who you are in Christ. You don't understand your position in Christ. You don't know who's working in you. You don't know what you have in Christ. You'll keep living out of the flesh instead of living out of the spirit because you don't know how to. As babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Be, ye, uh, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. There's biblical proof that what I just said is true. When you, when you do not renew your mind, you will continue to manifest world conformity or being shaped or fashioned according to the world. But Paul said, be not shaped, fashioned, molded according to the world, but be ye metamorphosed, have a metamorphosis, how? By the renewing of your 
mind. It is the revelation of who you are, what you are, where you're seated that enables you to break off the mold of being fashioned like the world. You can be born again and act like a sinner. And then you got people going around telling it's okay to keep acting like a sinner. But Paul didn't say that. <coughs> what did he say? He said, well, well the Romans, it's Romans chapter 12, verse 1, where is what I'm quoting from, and 2, two actually 2. But verse 1, come on. It still won't separate. This new Bible, these pages are really thin, and they're still... Yeah. Ushers, throw him out. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present, your, listen to this, present your bodies a living sacrifice. And I know I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but think about this now in the light of what Paul's talking about, having yielded our members as servants of unrighteousness. Here he's talking about he's having this, this, this there's a battle that can go on between the flesh and the spirit and how that, you know, that, you know, you're carnal, you're sold under sin. And here he comes in chapter 12 and says, I, bese I beg you, I beg you. By the mercies of God, that you just keep living like you're living because you're going to get to heaven anyway. It's not what it says, is it? No. That you present your bodies, a, your bodies, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reason. And the word reason, which you go study out in the Greek, you don't have to study real hard, spiritual. Now, how you got, I don't know, I don't, you know, you got to understand, these things were written, you know, 1611, it's been modified some since then, but words carry different meaning or different import uh, in those days than they do now. How many know the word conversation? Yeah. What do we mean when we say, if you hear somebody say, hey, um, uh, that's, that's a conversation going on over there. Well, we mean somebody's talking. But the Bible tells us to have a holy conversation. It don't mean have a holy tongue. The word, when it was translated, meant lifestyle. See, a holy lifestyle, not a holy, and, we, and of course a holy lifestyle would include talking holy. But that's not what it meant when they, here he says here, you know, you offer your body a living sacrifice, which is your reason or spiritual service. And how will you offer your body? To God. Now somehow or another, that doesn't carry with me the import that you can go do anything with your body you want to, and it doesn't matter when the Bible says to give it to God as a sacrifice. What's sacrificial? Not letting it do what it wants to do, but demanding it live the way God says. Amen. You're just bondage preacher. You're just too free. The Bible says not to use your liberty as an occasion to the flesh. <clears throat> Paul Somebody says, you know, the Bible's already balanced. No, if you take scriptures out of context and use them a different way, you can make them unbalanced. So the, so the whole is balanced. Things taken out and placed in different settings and shared in a way that is not within the parameters or within the context of how it was originally written is unbalanced. All right? So Paul you know, comes along one place and says, look, don't use your liberty. Talks about being free, but don't use it as an occasion to the flesh. And here's why. Your flesh wants to drown you in defeat. It wants to live according to the course of this world. Amen. Paul writes and talks about this, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. That might be Ephesians. Is that Ephesians chapter 2 or... The spirit that works in the, you know, that now works in the children of disobedience. Where is it? Okay. Where in time past? Look, you who were quick, he, you who were dead in trespasses and sin, wherein you walked in time past, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh. Listen to this. In the children of disobedience, chapter, verse 3, among whom also we all had our conversation lifestyle. How? 
in time past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. He says here that the lust of the flesh and the desires of the mind are, uh, the, which are the, children of, the children of wrath. He says, we walked in that in time past. Now he comes in Romans 12 and says, yield your body. A living sacrifice. Why? Because your body wants to walk in the lust of the flesh and the desires of the mind and walk under the what? Domain of the spirit of disobedience or the spirit of the nature of sin. Satan is the father of the nature of sin. And it wants to drag you willingly for most Christians right back into captivity and bondage. And it will hurt you. See, the ultimate end, you know, oh, man, I just feel so much better that I'm free from people telling me I can't do such and such. My question is, as a Christian, why would you want to do such and such? If you're listening to your spirit, your spirit doesn't want to do such and such. As a matter of fact, Paul goes on and talks about this conflict. I feel the conflict within you. <laughs> Father, there's still good in you. I feel, let go of your anger. Let go of your hate. <laughs> anyway. Oh, I jumped, I jumped all the way across the whole page here. I'm sorry. For I am the know that the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow, not for what I would, that I do not, but what I hate, that I do. If I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now, Paul here is, this is the struggle. See, there's a struggle. He was having a struggle knowing the law of God said you can't do this, wanting to obey God, but his flesh. Remember why? Because before he got saved, he was under the dominion of the nature of sin, which meant what? Sin could constrain him to obey it. And we said last week that when you were freed from sin or the nature of sin, sin, sin nature no longer has the authority to constrain you to obey it. But when, to a sinner, they, they just, <clears throat> like Darth Vader, I must obey my master. The Star Wars sermon. All right. Okay. And, under, and, and then Paul comes along <clears throat> and says, here, I'm having the, I was having this struggle. I'm, I'm carnal. I'm sold under sin. And the things that I want to do, I can't do them. And now it's no more that I'm doing, but sin that dwells in what? The nature of sin drove Paul and every other person who's not born again, drove them to disobey the laws of God and obey the carnality or the dominion of the nature of sin. For I know that in me that is in my flesh. Notice Paul says, that dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. This is why we keep telling people over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. You cannot keep yielding to the flesh and expect the results of a supernatural life. You cannot let the flesh have dominancy. You can't keep going back to the things that God delivered you from to look for satisfaction, to look for relief, to look for peace. When Jesus is your peace, Jesus is your deliverer, Jesus is your sanctifier, Jesus is your empowerment, Jesus is your all in all, glory to God. You're not going to find it anywhere else. I know I, it's no, I'm not preaching that any single person, but I am telling you, if you've got to go home this afternoon and get you a cognac, if you've got to go home this afternoon and get you a glass of wine and get relaxed, you're hooked on something other than what you need to be hooked on. You need to go home. If you've got problems and you're not relaxed, you, need, don't need a, you don't need a pill. You don't need an alcohol. You don't need a joint. You don't need anything else. What you need to do is go get by yourself and get in your closet and say, and let the Holy Ghost, let the spirit of the living God rise up on the inside of you and let peace and tranquility overtake you glory to God <coughs> amen we're letting the world's methods do what God from the outside in do what God wants to do from the inside out Agua. 
or me be free. Por favor. I've already gone through two glasses. Hallelujah. And I'm just warming up. Hallelujah. All right. For the good that I would, I do not. The evil that I would not, that I do. In other words, his, 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 his heart, or at least his thinking, says the law says this is wrong, and I don't want to do this. But in his flesh, it's a domination. That's why, now see, you understand, when you read Romans chapter 12, after having read this, now you understand. Paul, is, and Paul goes on and establishes some things, and when he gets to chapter 12 and says, you know, beseech you to, by, uh, to present your body as a living sacrifice, here's why. Because chapter 6 says, to whomever you yield your members, his servants you are, whether a sin unto death or unto God for righteousness. My beloved brothers and sisters, here and in the church world, watch them. Listen, when we say things and we say, you know, that grace doesn't allow you just to get away with stuff, it is not so you can feel condemned. Your heart will condemn you. Paul's heart was condemning him. Amen? Paul's heart was condemning him. Paul's heart was telling him, don't do this. Paul's heart was saying, you shouldn't do that. But then his flesh was saying, you're going to do it whether you like it or not. And he was in a struggle. We don't need to be in a daily struggle. Y'all, here you go home. Now, if I do what I would not, it is no more that I do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find the law that when I do, would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me? From the body of this death. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Oh, there's your answer. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with my flesh, the law of sin. Now, stop. Let's see. Think about this now. He's not saying that you have to. See, now Paul comes over here and he goes on. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The majority text says, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. The minor text says it's not there, but it is in verse 4 in either case, okay? They that are after the Spirit, the things of the, let's say, um, who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit, that's in the majority and the minor text. So, you know, whether it's in verse 1 or not, you, you can just argue that all day long, but the fact is the context of verses 1 through 4 are finished up with who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. It's about the majority of the minor text. In other words, the, the oldest manuscripts we have, one's referred to as the majority text, one's referred to as the minority text, or the, man, the, the, man, the manscules and the minscules or something like that. That's another word they used to use. Okay? But look at this. There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Let me tell you this. It's not God that's going to condemn you. Your own heart will condemn you. You walk in the flesh, your heart will condemn you. All right? See, we're, trying, we're so busy trying to get people to be not condemned, we're not letting God deal with them about things they're doing that he shouldn't be doing. And here's the key. It's not that you should be condemned and live in that condemnation when you sin. That, that should bring you to what? Godly sorrow worketh repentance. When you miss the mark, when you sin as a believer, then you do what 1 John 1, 9 says, and it's in the Bible. I don't care. If you got one, it ain't, it ain't a God Bible. It's a rewritten Bible. <coughs> Hallelujah. But when, you, when, you, when your heart says you shouldn't have done that, what do you do? No, come boldly to the throne of grace that you may receive mercy in the time of need. <coughs> mercy and grace in the time of need to help. God won't cast you aside. He'll wash you clean. We can set, and if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay? 1 John 1, 9 is in the Bible, and it's there so that if any man sinned. Amen. Oh, Lord, yes. Hold your place in Romans chapter 7. Go to 1 John chapter 1. 
there's been a big hoo about this past few years because some preacher thought he could go out there and say, you know, listen, people say some of the dumbest stuff and people just buy into it because it, it, feel, it fits their mantra. Let me say this. The Bible is not about making you feel good all the time. The Word of God is not a feel-good book. Take me for, now listen, hear me out. If you walk with God and you, stay, and you keep yourself right and when you mess up and you sin, you repent, you will feel good because you walk with the Lord. But the Bible is not a self-help, motivational, make you feel better about life book. It is a bring you into the image of Christ book. And in that, he that endureth chastening, Paul said if God, doesn't, God chastens those whom he loves, and if he doesn't chase you, chasten you, you're a bastard. Then, you know, you know and then no, he went on and said this, no one enjoys chastening. You cannot preach the whole counsel of the word of God and not have it chasten people. And there is, there is something in the heart where God says, you've displeased me in this. And a godly sorrow comes, and it puts repentance to work, and you repent, and then the blood of Jesus cleanses you from all unrighteousness and brings you into full restoration. And God loves you all the way through the whole thing. But the Bible says he chastens those he loves. See, the feel-good preachers leave that out. Because we want everybody to feel good. I want you to be feel good. But I'm not going to make you feel good at the expense of growth. I'm not going to make you feel good at the expense of dealing with the things that are holding you back from walking where God wants you to walk. But we're just a happy, clappy church. We all come here and everybody leaves and just feels hunkadory. There are going to be days you're going to feel unhunkadory. But God's doing a work. And God's ridding you of the things that are hindering you. Hebrews chapter 11, no, 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and, and the sin that does so easily. Why? Beset us. Weights and sin will beset you, knock you off course. So God will bring the word, and, the, and this is good news because the good news is this. This is wrong. Bring in an acknowledgement of what is wrong. That's bad news. You can't preach that. No, 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 no. You have to recognize what's wrong so you can apply the answer to rid you of that wrong. The good news is God demands you not do this. You've done this. The good news is there is a provision for reconciliation from that. There is good news in that. Amen. Not just to make you feel bad, but you've got, you have got to be able to recognize that something is sin in order to deal with it. And preachers and people who just want to go around and tell everybody that you're okay, it doesn't matter what you do, God still, yes, God still loves you. But God loves people who went to hell. God loves the people whose names will be blotted out of the Lamb's book of life. Hello? His love for them, he sent Jesus for them too. So to take the love of God and make it into a what it is not, and what, what, what people make it into, they make the love of God into a, a, a part of God that actually does not even acknowledge that something was wrong. No, the love of God saw that something was wrong and sent the answer to fix what was wrong. And every time you mess up and get wrong, the answer's already been provided to fix it. That's the love of God. Amen. We think the way people are teaching love of God now, it's that, you know, oh, God just don't care that you went out and shot 45 people. And God sent an answer to redeem you from that. Are you here? There's an answer for that, that, that anger in your heart that made you do that and that nature that made you do that. There's an answer to that, but he does care you shot 45 people because he cared about those 45 people too. I just told the family the other day, somebody says, you know, drink is no worse than gluttony. How many people are killed every year because of a gluttonous driver? 
Now, on the side that sin is sin, okay. But on the repercussion side of the natural, how many people are dying? How many marriages break up every year because somebody over ate at the, at the uh, Golden Corral bar? How many stumble into their house at midnight because they've been down at the all-you-can-eat buffet and, you know, and, and flop in the bed because they, they can't, you know, they're so drunk and they, they puke all over the place and they, you know, they wet themselves and all this kind of stuff because they were out eating too much. So they're not the same. Now, on the side of saying sin is sin, yes, but in the, in the scheme of life, the repercussions of things are different. The consequences are different. That one ever big. Where was I? Did somebody say something? Told it. <laughs> All right. Verse 9, if we can, listen, walk in lights, he's in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have no sin, it means now here, notice it says sin. Say if we've never been under the nature of sin, we, we, do not, we deceive ourselves, and, and the truth is not in us. If you, can, if you come on and say, I was born righteous, you're lying. If we confess our sins, different thing. The sinner does not confess his sins. Peter told the church, repent, be baptized everyone in the name of the Lord Jesus, and you'll be saved. Paul wrote to the church and says, if you will confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God's raised us from the dead, you'll be saved. The Christian confesses his sins. The believer, after he is saved, when he sins, confesses that. Amen. He is faithful to, and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we've not sinned, we make him a liar. Now, if you come here and say, I've never sinned, you're lying. If you're breathing, you've sinned. So here we have it. The nature of sin, we've all had that. We, you know, if we, don't, if, if, if we say we never sinned, we never, you know, we've been born again. You were born again from the nature of sin to the nature of God. You were born unto sin. If you say you never sin, you're lying. But as a Christian, if you do sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You know, you can't just go, 1 John 1, 9 wasn't written to the church. Who in the world was it written to? Because sinners don't confess their sins. Read your Bible. Sinners confess the lordship of Jesus, believe that God's raised him from the dead, and what's he doing? He's born again because he acknowledges a new lord or, or, or new master or a new king. How many know what kingdom is? The king's dominion. That's what kingdom means. The king's dominion. You've entered into the dominion of a new king. When you got born again. You couldn't confess all your sins if you tried. There'd be at least two you forgot. I don't care when you get saved. You'd forget one. There's no way in the world that a sinner can acknowledge and confess every single sin. So what does he do? He comes lost without God, without hope in this world, and comes and acknowledges the Lord, a new lordship over his life, and declares Jesus the Lord of his life. <laughs> he believes that God's raised him from the dead, and he's born again. So that the nature of sin, the sin nature, the sin dominion, no longer lords over him. He's declared a new lord. And Jesus comes in as the Lord of his life. If you sin after you're born again, you've committed sins. And if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse you of your sins. And to, I mean, uh, to forgive your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. <clears throat> First John 1, 9 was written to the church. How do you know? Oh, well. That which you've seen from the beginning, which you've heard, which our eyes have seen, which we've looked upon in our hands have handled, the word of life, for the life was manifest, da, da, da. Verse 3, that which we've seen declare unto you um, that you may also have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son. These things we write unto you that you, that you, unto you that your joy may be full. Amen. And then he goes on and keeps writing. Verse 2, my little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. I... Where did the yodel brains come up with this stuff and not read their Bible? I don't know what else to call 
They're going to teach us stuff. They're try, because everybody wants to make everybody happy. But see, true happiness and true joy and true satisfaction comes in what? In walking in accordance with God and his word. If you walk in accordance with God and his word, there will be joy in your heart. When you go crossways of God and his word, there will not be joy, and you're going to have to get that cleared so you can walk and have the joy once again. It's amazing what happens when you, when you know God's forgiven you. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to clean, forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My little children, these things right out to you. Who's he talking to? The same bunch he's been talking to in chapter 1, he called them my little children. And if any man, listen, listen. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's perpetuation for our sins, not for ours only, but for also for the whole world. If we confess our sins, he is faithful. Who's he? The propitiation. The propitiation is the one that we confess to, and he's faithful just to cleanse us. And if we, may, if we sin, we have an advocate for the Father, Jesus Christ. He argues our case and right to forgiveness based on his blood that's on the mercy seat of God. Amen. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not out to the flesh but out to the Spirit. For the law, the Spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, some people try to teach that the law of sin and death, um, well, I, I guess you can. You can look at it both ways. What the law could not do, then it was weak through sinful flesh. You know, you can say it's the Old Testament law, but you can also look at it as the law of that nature of sin. It's the law of death. And what the law, if you want to call it the Old Testament law, then the law of sin and death is the law that simply tells you that this is sinful and it brings death to you. All right? For what the law could not do is that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now, even people who say that that, that verse, that phrase is it in verse 1, have to admit that it's in all the other, it's all in all the other text in verse 4. And it's all talking about the same thing here. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? But it sums it up. If you walk after the law of the spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus, it's not the law of sin and death. If you walk after the spirit, not after the flesh. If you walk after the flesh, Paul's already told you in chapter 6 that whoever you yield your members to, your subjects, or you are, you're, those are the members, th those... No, you're not to whom you yield your servants to, yourselves servants to obey. His servants you are to obey, whether sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. You put yourself there. That's what you're going to live out of. Or that's what you're going to reap. The, that's what you're going to reap from. You don't have to. The law, of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, has made us free from what's it? the law. Sin. What's it done? It has separated us from the dominion of that and put us under a new dominion. We walk in a, remember, walk in, we're to walk in newness of life. We walk in a whole new plane altogether. We do not have to live under the dominion of sin. Can somebody say glory? We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.